Good morning, Pastor Tim Maddox, Northside Community Church. So glad to have you here. If you're watching on Facebook or YouTube or some, some kind of way, we're just glad that you're able to partake. And we missed you. We want to invite you to come back always, of course. Uh, we're progressing through the Gospel of Luke and we're headed right to Easter because Easter is the culmination of Christmas. Do you know that? Easter and Christmas always go together. God came. God did what he did. And then God died. And God rose again. That's Easter. So we're headed to Easter. It's March 12th, in case you don't know what the date is. And um, you're probably in your home or car or something. And so I want to read to you this morning uh, from the Gospel of Luke, who's taking us to Easter. And I'm in the 15th chapter. And it goes like this, verses 1 through 10. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and his neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found a lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the home, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day, for this morning, for your word. Lord, I ask you to teach, take stuff out of my mind that People don't need to hear and put stuff back in. And Lord, I pray that uh, you would speak to all of us about our relationship with you and uh, your relationship with lost people and what that looks like and what we look like when we're lost. So we offer ourselves up to you today in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so we're in this uh, journey to Jerusalem and Jesus is winding his way down. I think he'd be south from Galilee where Peter's home was. He's winding his day, way south. If you happen to watch The Chosen, they're kind of doing that a little bit, I think. But he's teaching what's happening as he's encountering people, he'll encounter situation, and then he'll teach a parable. He goes into a thing called parables. Parables are made up stories to teach the truth about God. Let me say that one again. The shortest version, the shortest definition, a parable, which is a strange story that's made up to teach people how to connect with God. The missing connection. Metaphor and metaphor, if you're from the South, they're metaphors. And so uh, Jesus is doing this like the one where the guy says, uh, what's the greatest command in the law? And, and Jesus told him, of course, there's love of God, love uh, your neighbor as yourself. And then, he, and then <laughs> the sly guy comes up with the final question and he says, hey, who's my neighbor? And so Jesus tells what parable? The parable of the Good Samaritan. Awesome. And what about the two guys that come to Jesus and ask, Jesus, will you tell my brother to give me the inheritance? They're arguing, daddy died, and who's got the will? They're arguing about who gets what. And what did Jesus say? He went and told the story. He said, I have no responsibility in this. This is not. Jesus had pretty good boundaries. And then we just covered another parable, and he keeps doing these things as he has encounters with people. The parable, we goes to the party, the Sabbath party, and we covered that last week really well, I think, uh, about where people sat, and who's honored, and who's not honored, and all this stuff that, that Jesus uh, kind of recast in the notion of who God is and who we are. And so now we come to, I think, the premier centerpiece of Luke's teaching. By the way, this is the only gospel that has this story. And it's called the prodigal son. It's um, probably better known prodigal God because it's about wasting things. Some people think 
Devotion to God is a waste. They do. And uh, we find the exact opposite. So here we are. We're talking about uh, lostness and savedness and finding things. And so I just want to kind of do a one, two, three with you. I'll, I want to talk about the context of what we, where we find ourselves and where they found, where Jesus found himself. The context of this story, why it's at. Sometimes when you don't understand context, you can't really say, hey, that's good or that's bad because you don't know the context. You don't know who he was speaking to and why he was saying what he was saying. That's true with all of us. We all get quoted out of context, not just politicians. And, and also, a couple things about God. So there's a one, there's a context, there's a couple things about God. And then there's, I think, about three responses we can have as the church, as Christians, to this. And so, one thing about context, two things about God, three things about us. I, I like that. It's a one, two, three. It's, it's great. So, here we are... Uh, there's this, uh, there, Jesus is arriving at a certain place and he's got tax, he's got sinners and tax gatherers and, and religious people following him. And he's, and he's on the road again. And, and so there is this crowd of people. And I don't know where you would situate yourself in the crowd as a sinner, as a a uh, tax gatherer or a religious person. I'm not sure, but that's part of the context. We find ourselves in a context. We live in the United States of America in 2023, kind of a fragmented, unsure nation, doesn't know what it is, lots of problems raised, on and on and on. So we find ourselves in that context. You also have the context of your life. Where have you been? What's your world? Are you fragmented? Are you confused about things. God's not interested in leaving you confused. That's us. It's always me. Sometimes I just lose my equilibrium, spiritually speaking. I don't know what's up and what's down. That's what the nature of sin. So, uh, you know, and, and, and so this is about uh, what the context is. And so I just want to talk about those three um, categories of people that we find in this, the beginning of this parable, they, they help launch the parable. They're, they're the impetus for, for the explosion out of Jesus' mouth of this story. This story that's not true, but it's true. He made the story up. Jesus, that's how Jesus taught. He said, let me tell you where God is and where you are. It's a great, amazing thing that the Lord did. His teaching. And I did tell you over the last couple of weeks, I'm going to lead you to understand God's joy and our joy. So look for that today. See that. Um, so uh, anyway, so there is this, you know, there's the story and there's these three uh, community of people. So first of all, there's the tax guy. Let's talk about tax guys for just a second. Who are these tax guys? Because I think we give kind of a minimal definition. I find I've done that a lot too, and I kind of regret it, but, but I can only do better. That's all I can do. I look back at my old sermons and go, ah, you know, and I, and I want to help them. And so, you know, kind of grow them up a little bit. And, and so tax gatherers, it was a little different maybe. And, and, and uh, tax gatherers, you know, they have the same, a little bit of similar reputation today, but it probably different than this for sure. So there was the Romans who ruled everything. Their footprint is all over the Middle East. You can go see it today. There's still a lot of their stuff. It's all there. So the Romans didn't like to collect taxes themselves. So what they did is they would put out a, a notice and they were looking for people that would just gather the taxes and they would bid on it. So... They would say, hey, we want, uh, we want a million uh, shekels. I think that's the, yeah, that's, they still use shekels in, the, in Israel today. They, we want a million shekels from this community up here by Galilee. And so people would bid, oh, I can do it for you, and I'll, I'll do it for, you know, so much. And so it was kind of a bidding war, and then someone would win. And, and if you've watched The Chosen, you see Matthew the tax gatherer. He's kind of quirky. I, I like his weird personality, but here is a tax gatherer. So they got the contract. Basically, they said, okay, you're going to be our tax gatherer for the Galilee area. So uh, do your stuff. 
And here's, here's what happens. You go out, so they, what the, it went like this. They would go out and they would set up little stands along the traveling roads, the roads that they had, you know, the footpaths, the donkey paths, the cart paths. Uh, you know, there's the, the, the via uh, road that went all the way to Egypt. There's roads, you know, old roads have been there for years. So they'd set up and as people came by, they'd say, where are you from? Hey, you guys owe 15% of your income, how many shekels you got, or you can give us some chickens or whatever, however they collected. And so the, it was notorious that tax gatherers would say, well, you know, Caesar wants 20% now, so we need 20% of what you got. And... And then the other thing that would occur when people balked or pushed back on those tax gatherers, you know what happened, right? The tax gatherers had a Roman garrison that was there and he would go tell the, the head guy of that and they would send out soldiers. So if you think about it very long, I was trying to think of a comparison, it would probably be kind of mafia. Kind of mafia bosses in cities where they come and they extract money for you for protection. And if you don't uh, do that, they send their, uh, you know, their strong arm guys and, and, and they'll thump you, you know. And, and so there was sort of that. So they had the tax gathers, but behind them was the Romans. The Romans just didn't want to do it. So they got Jews to do it. And so they were hated. What about sinners? So that's tax. What about a sinner? What is a sinner? A sinner is a less than Jew. He's less than what a really good religious person looks like. They were, um, it was just a common term. It, it meant that they sinned, that they committed infractions against God's law all over the place, like all of us still do, sinners. We still use that. It's still a good applicable word. I am a sinner. I pray you know you are a sinner. Can't be a Christian unless you know that about yourself. So, um, so they were just kind of less than, and so Jesus seemed to make friends with those people. And so the tax gatherers and the sinners, and he even went to parties. You know, he went to Matthew's house for a party. It was a bunch of tax, it was like a tax gatherers convention. And he hung out with them. And so that created a rub. There's the rub. That created a rub with the religious people. They said, you know, he's, we think he's a drunkard. Was Jesus ever drunk? Not once. Clear, crystal clear. He's a drunkard and he hangs out with the wrong people. So there's the less than sinners, there's the, the uh, less than people, and then there's the tax gatherers, and then there's the religious people. And um, the heat, as I told you last week, the heat's going up and the heat's going to reach a crescendo, isn't it? They're going to kill him. It's just, and he knows it. He's already told the disciples, it's coming, but when I say, not when they say. And so he's on his way to Jerusalem. And so here's the religious guys, and they're just the insecurity of people with power and position and, and influence, you know. They were the influencer, and this guy's taking away our influence. And I don't know, he doesn't quite do it like we do it. It's not quite right. But we sure lie, you know, and the truth is about the Pharisees, about that religious movement, just FYI for your information, a, a huge amount of those Pharisees became Christians in the first century. They turned. A lot of them did. But not then. And so, here is, uh, you know, here is the, here's the, the group and the mutterings going on. And so Jesus goes into this story. And it's great because it's a three, it's a three parable. It's kind of a progression. He starts off with some sheep. So, um, and so this is where we learn two things about God. Just two things. Two is all we need to know in this story. In these three. And we'll just really cover the first parables. But they all linked. And so Jesus uh, talks about, uh, you know, a uh, shepherd. And he has 99 and he loses one. And so he's, he's out there and uh, they, uh, he finally finds his sheep. And, uh, you know, he's just really, he, he seems to almost endanger the 99 to go get the one, doesn't he? Maybe a way that we could understand that is this. Hey, parent, you have five kids. What's the big deal about losing one? What's the big deal? Oh, I know your parental heart would break and just slay you to lose that one. So, 
How is God like that about all of us? I can't understand the fathom, the heart that God has for people that are far from him. I can't. Sometimes I get a hint of it. But so here, uh, you know, and, and uh, so he goes looking, you know, he goes looking for his sheep and he's just on the hunt. And, and so uh, then he does then, so that God's a shepherd. Well, not really, but yes, he is. And then all of a sudden God's a woman. <laughs> this is not a gender story. You could just nix that from your brain group there. I am telling you. But it, it's a woman. And a woman loses... A coin, one silver coin, drachma, uh, day's wage. Let's go day's wage, low end 200, high end 500 or 1,000 a day or whatever it is some people can make. But all of that money gone. And she's in a little house. Remember, they don't have big man. She's a little house and she can't find it. So she goes in a panic and I mean, she just does. She's in a panic to search for the coin. So God is the one who's searching for people. That helps me as a church leader. I hope that helps you as a Christian that, to know that God was already searching before you got up out of bed. Before the church gets its act together, God is searching for people who are far from him. He's the searcher. And so this... You know, I, I don't know what kind of search you are. I don't know if you ever lose stuff. I saw a funny one the other day. It showed this gal and she's looking around in her car and she's got her cell phone and a light on. She's just looking around and, and her husband comes up and said, what are you doing, honey? He said, I'm looking for my phone. Searching. Uh, let me ask you this. Parents, do your, your kids ever lose anything? You lose stuff. I lose stuff all the time. Your kids lose stuff. And usually, how does it go when your kids lose stuff? They say, hey, dad, have you seen my phone? And you say, no, I haven't. Uh, and you ask them this question. Here's the question you always ask. Did you look for it? Yeah, I looked on my bed. Well, that's good. Look anywhere else. You know, did you look on the couch? You, and, and then the real searcher, though, in homes, I find it's not so much the dad, it's the mom. So if you ask the mom, she will say, look, it's probably in the same place I found it the last time, the time before that, the time before that. It's probably, under, it's, it's, and they are amazing searchers. And they know exactly what you did. God is an amazing searcher. He seeks them out. That's his heart. To find them. So God is the searcher. We are not doing this solo on the strength of our efforts. We are doing this working with. We are, how did Paul say it? Co-labors with God in Christ. We work with. And so that's good news for us as a church. We work with. And then the second thing that we find is, is God is a, a searcher. Not only that, is that when this, the guy finds his sheep, he says, wow, he calls, no phone. So somehow he called his neighbors and he said, hey, come over. I found the, my lost sheep. I want to have a party. So not only is God a searcher, but he's a celebrator. He celebrates when he finds, when they become found. The woman celebrates when she finds that coin. Because it means a lot. It means a lot. And so there is a, a, a joy. It says, it says right in the parable. And this is the part where it's totally not a made up story. But a real story. It said there is joy in heaven every time one sinner repents. One sinner repents. There is the joy. <laughs> and, and God is a celebrator. And um, I like at our church, when we baptize, we celebrate. We holler, we do, we, we, because we believe we have been on a search with God and someone has been found. 
That's what we believe. And it is a, a joy that overtakes. And that's God's joy. God's joy is finding people. But remember, God's strength to be found is the same strength for you Christians to obey Him when you're having a struggle. The grace to be obedient to God is the same grace that finds people. The strength of God is at work in both. It's the same. But God... How does, God, how does God do it in heaven? Let's just look. It says, it says that all the angels rejoice. So when someone gets saved, God says, Hey, you all. Michael, Gabriel, whatever names of the rest of you guys. Hey, here's someone. And they have like a, you know, like a ticker tape parade. You know, where there's uh, confetti. You know, I don't know if anybody's ever had a parade for you. But I kind of always felt like the church I got saved at just, just paraded me, celebrated me. Isn't that the way it ought to be? Because we are mirroring God's joy. Mirroring God's joy. And, but, and then this goes on to tell the parable of the prodigal son. And, um, and so it, it, it narrows into kind of a family situation and gets really applicable. It could be the parable of the prodigal daughter and mother. It could be all of those things. It just happens to be in the context of that culture, the prodigal father. God is not a woman. God is not a shepherd. God is not a father. God is God. He's apart from all that. But what does it say? It says that when a... Every time one sinner does what? Repent. They repent. It's the repentance that God loves because it means they're really found. Repentance is turning away from doing life your way to saying, God, I want to do it your way. It's turning away from owning our life to giving our life back to the one who made it. It's a true act of repentance. Christian repentance, and that's why it's such a good time before Easter for those of us that are Christians to repent of our sins, of the backbiting, the gossip, the baloney, the divisive things, the, all the, our own personal sins with drugs and sex and all the mess, all the poisons, the hatred we pour into our minds or well, all the poisons just to, to get a detox going in our life before Easter or we won't see it. We won't see God at work. And so, and it's, repentance also involves some grief about where we've been. Uh, when the prodigal son comes home, he has grief. It's, uh, and repentance is not regrets. Oh, I got caught. Somebody knows what I did. That's not it. It's godly grief. And I, it, 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 the basics, I was wrong, God, you are right. I now trust myself to you. See, there's nothing really beautiful in me for God. He just chooses to love me and his desire is that I repent and turn myself over to him. And then there's a parade. And the confetti and the, the yelling and hollering, all that stuff starts. So God's so we all have a context. God is a seeker and a searcher. It says actually in Second Chronicles that God searches to and fro the earth, the whole earth all the time looking for anybody that would just be his. That's, that's not a New Testament concept. That's God. That's the way God is. He's always searching for someone who wants to stay in contact with the one who made him. He's always looking for them. And so... God is a seeker, and then when we come, he's a celebrator. So a few things for us as Northside, as Christians, is we need to be mindful. Number one, we need to be mindful of relationships and repentance. There's a tension between relationships that we build with non-believers 
and sinners <laughs> and tax gatherers and, 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 and repentance. So you have relationships and repentance. This is a church that has relationship with many, with many sinners and at times many, many, probably more sinners sometimes frequent our campus than religious people. But there is a tension between relationship and repentance. There's a tension that we have to have. If you let go of one or the other, you are not doing the, we are not doing the Lord's work. It's like a plow. You got to hang on to both sides. And so, uh, you know, if you're a doctor and you don't have any patients and you're not really a doctor, if you're a farmer and you don't want to get your hands dirty, you're not going to make anything. And the church always needs sinners Always looking for some good, honest sinners. Where are they? And um, we can't just fear contamination. I'm glad the church that I went to didn't fear me too much, you know. Uh, there's dangers. Uh, but there is a form of Christianity that's out there right now that you just make friends with sinners. That's all you're called to do. And that's just nuts. Doesn't work. And then there's just this other kind of thing where it's, oh, you're just hollering about how bad the world is. There's separation. So it's neither. It's both and. That is false picture. Danger. Sinners. Uh, here, here's the, uh, the reason. And it's Jesus, of course. Jesus was able to eat and drink. Not drink. Not, not drink to drink. But eat and be with sinners and so he was more inclusive than anybody has ever been in the history of the world. And at the same time, he's harder on sin than anybody has ever been in the world. Gee, that is not tolerance. That is something different. And we accept that in the person of our Savior. He was more inclusive. He could include anybody. And he was so hard on sin. Oh, well, what's all this talk about? If your eye makes you sin, pull it out. If your hand makes you sin, cut it off. Bad thoughts, you deserve hell. What is that? Where'd that go? We love all the sinner stuff, but we forget what Jesus did with the sinners. And the thing that's really music to God's ears is repentance sinners. Not just sinners or not just tax gatherers, but people who have been called and heartbroken over their lives apart from God. That's all repentance is. So let's go for all kinds of lost people, Northside. Doesn't matter where they've been, what they've done. Let's do it. And let's call them to repentance. Let's introduce them to the love of God that calls them to. There's a waiting father for them. There's a waiting dad for them. There's a waiting God. Remember the prodigal son, where is he at? Oh yeah, I love the way Jesus was so good at poking the, the religious people. He said, oh yeah, he was destitute and in a pig pen. You know, Jews can't touch pork, right? It was kind of a poke on those, the unclean. But at some point that boy said, I think my father has something better for me than what I've created. Sin exponentially destroys human beings. I have showed you the, there's a portrait that Rembrandt did of the prodigal son coming home. It's a beautiful thing. Older brother's kind of scowling down. The father's just so glad to see his son. But what you haven't seen is Rembrandt's other thing when he's sitting in a brothel with a woman being the prodigal son. Rembrandt himself. The painter. And it shows him in a nice hat and all this stuff. Everything's really cool and you can tell he's kind of in a risque place. And then when in the prodigal son, Rembrandt, you see the son bow beneath the father and the father's just hugged and he's bald and he's got barely any clothes on. He looks like he came off Union Avenue. You want to know what sin does to people? I, I, I challenge you to go cruise up and down Union 10 times and pray. Or five, maybe three, maybe once will get you. Sin reduces people to nothing. And I thank God that I had a church that told me, boy, you're loved. Boy, you need to repent. So, there's an elder son that doesn't want to party. And Jesus just, you know, he doesn't want to party with his son. He resents him because he took all the money. He blew it. And look at him. He looks like a mess. Looked like he drugged what the cat drug in. And he said, I don't want nothing to do with that punk. And so, there is that religious attitude 
that is deadly as well. And Jesus doesn't even solve it. He just leaves the story hanging. It's just hanging in the air. So, older brothers, younger brothers. They both need the Lord. They both need repentance. They both need to know what God has done for them and what he calls. And that it's okay to turn yourself over to the good father. The one who will rejoice when we do that. And so, when we, what, what's really interesting about the flip side of when we repent is, and I found it, I can't even explain it, is how much joy shows up in your life. When you know you're now with God. You know that Jesus did what you couldn't do. And he loved you in an incredible way. Paid an ultimate price. So you could be free from the power of sin in your life. And live a different life that you cannot live apart from a relationship with Christ. I pray you've done that today. Father, thank you for this moment. Thank you for your word this day. In Jesus' name, amen.